Uh, there's a famous quote by physicist Dr. Stephen King who said, religion is a fairy tale for those afraid of the darkness. In response, Dr. John Lennox, a mathematician from Cambridge University said, atheism is a fairy tale for those afraid of the light. <laughs> I'm so glad that as a people who know and love Jesus Christ as our savior and as our king, we have no need to fear either the darkness or the light. And in fact, the light is something that we can run to. And even more than that, kingdom light is something that we carry within us on the inside. John 3, sorry, John 8, 12. Then Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. And he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. This is probably the foundation scripture for my message this morning. We have fellowship. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And I want to encourage you and invite you this morning to take uh, a refreshing and renewing walk in the light. Let it be an intimate walk with the one who is the light, Jesus. We're called to walk in strong contrast to the darkness that is happening all around us in our world. Uh, and, and the light will become even brighter as it shines in the midst of that darkness. So the purpose of my message this morning is not only about our walk with Jesus, but also very much about our walk with one another. They are both incredibly important. These two intertwining, joined together walks of life uh, reflect the greatest of the two commandments, loving God with all our heart, our soul, our strength, our mind, but also then coming straight after that is loving one another. Some of you would be aware that uh, we received the shocking and tragic news recently that Martin Parr, a very much loved member of our church in, at Seacoast, uh, was killed in a head-on car accident where another vehicle veered across the road um, and, and hit Martin's car and Martin died at the scene. He was only 62 years old and left behind his wife, Ali, four adult children, beautiful children, and a grandchild that he also adored with another little one, a little boy, um, about to be born any day. So Ali and her family, who were, um, who were with her, came to church the very next Sunday. It was only about three or four days after the accident. Because she said, Ali said, there was no other place that I would want to be. That morning we experienced the most beautiful worship. It was all just as Martin would have wanted it to be. His family gathered in to their church family, worshipping. But the thing that made it the most, or the richest experience, was the way that the church came around Ali and the family. As they reached out to God in the midst of their grief and, and their pain, and it was like the whole church just loved on them, prayed for them, grieved with them, and shone the light of Christ in the midst of that incredible um, you know, of expression of true fellowship that I have seen in a long time. The scripture says, if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. That word fellowship means deep, authentic, intimate communion amongst those who love God with their whole heart. You know, I, can share, I could share some really special moments um, from that Sunday morning, but to be honest, they probably should just remain in that intimate place um, and time. But it made me realise once again that what we have, what we have together, the light and fellowship that we share as the body of Christ is an extraordinary and precious gift. And I think with all that 
um, Jackie was saying, we, we need to get this right. We need to be walking in this um, before we can probably cope with the revival that God wants to bring. And like most gifts, though, um, you know, we have to open them up. We have to allow them to become part of our life. 1 Peter 1, 22 to 25, and this is from the Passion Translation. It says, Now because of your obedience to the truth, you have purified your very souls. And this empowers you to be full of love for your fellow believers. So express this sincere love toward one another passionately and with a pure heart. For through the eternal and living word of God, you have been born again. You're not who you used to be. You have been born again. And this seed that, has been, that he planted in you can never be destroyed, but will live and grow inside you forever. For human beings are frail and temporary like grass, and the glory of man fleeting like blossoms of the field. The grass dries and withers and the flowers fall off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Our souls have been purified by the blood of Jesus Christ. And I've been reminded again as I prepared this message that having a pure heart is so empowering. It's, it's empowering in that every barrier, every hint of rejection, any bit of jealousy or any fear or, or shame or guilt or unforgiveness dissolves completely when we, are free, when we freely open up that gift and allow the seed he has planted in us to grow. The seed of light and truth and the revelation and gratitude of what Jesus has done for us, that seed of hope and life that he has planted in us, it makes our hearts pure. Pure motives pure godly love, pure fellowship. I've been part of many funeral, memorial, celebration services, some of which have been your loved ones. And they always remind me that our lives here are so temporary. The older I get, the more I realise how short life on this earth really is. Our lives are like grass that withers. Any glory, any perceived glory that we might build around our own lives is just, it's just like flowers that fall off the stem. The only thing that endures forever is the word of God. His promises, his love, his good news of salvation, his hope. We don't, we don't reign over our own lives. Many try but it always seems to come to nothing. And usually there's a lot of heartache and, and devastation along the way. Isaiah 52, 7 says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of, of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. I'm so grateful that God reigns. Jim White sometimes tries to have a go. And usually makes a mess of it. But the kingdom of light rules and reigns not only over me, but over you also, if you allow him to. The seed of the word of God, the seed of his love, the seed of eternal life is in you. And it is pure. I feel like this morning, I'm, God just wants me to speak it out. He just wants me to proclaim it, that this is who you are. And you might be sitting there thinking, oh yeah, but you don't know about this. You don't know what I've done. You don't know my thoughts. You don't know whatever. Well, I don't care about any of that. I go by the word of God. And he says you have a pure heart, that your motives are pure. And with that seed within us, we can freely come to God and worship him, love on him, you know, glorify him and serve him. And with a pure heart, we can also love each other. Without any emotional baggage or mindsets or judgments, cluttering up the fellowship that we share together. There's a lot of healing and, and restoration still to happen within the body of Christ. 
and I'm not talking about any particular church. I haven't come here today thinking this is just for you guys, nobody else. This is for the church. So I want to speak those words of life and purity and genuine deep fellowship over the church this morning. Because on top of, of what that really means for us, it's then what it means for those who are yet to know Jesus. And this is where it all fits in with what Jackie was proclaiming this morning. I often come back to that scripture in John 13. It says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know, all those out there will know, that, that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. That, that love is not just emotional. It can be emotional. Um, that love is not just a choice. It can be a choice. When God talks about uh, the brethren, he's talking about loving one another. He's talking about genuine, authentic, deep love and care. True fellowship, as in pure communion. And we all know how precious communion is, don't we? I believe this is a vital message. If we want to see the church become Christ's voice, his hands and his feet to our generation. And you know, Jesus has such beautiful feet. That's what Isaiah 52 says. How beautiful are the feet of him who brings good news. And that's first and foremost talking about Jesus. The message he brings is peace. Peace through salvation. And peace in the truth and the knowledge that our God reigns. And that is real peace. And God knows, God understands, he cares and he sees it all. But we, we can have beautiful feet too. And I'd like to turn to you to turn to someone and say, you have beautiful feet. Okay, that's enough. That's enough. Okay, back here. <laughs> you know, your feet, your feet carry you. That's the whole point. Your feet carry you. They carry who you are. Your feet carry a message that shines through, you know, how you live your life, uh, what words you speak, how you respond to others, because your life is a message to those around you. It is, is a message of hope, or is it? Is it a message of hope, a message of peace, uh, of truth, a message that points people to Jesus Christ? Is it a message that is fearless, courageous, unashamed of the gospel of Jesus. You know, God knows why we find it, you know, find ourselves guarding ourselves out of fear and rejection and maybe even anger, maybe because we, we just don't understand why something terrible has happened. But he has also empowered us with a love and a purity of heart that is supernatural. You cannot compare it to anything else in the world. come back again you know I, I really have been inspired by Martin's family they did not miss one Sunday gathering since the church um, since the church since Martin's passing of coming together with the church and Ali at yesterday we had the celebration service and Ali sang um, led a worship in that meeting and she sang praise the Lord O my soul And then Molly, Martin's daughter, sang the blessing. And I'll just remind you of a few of the words. It says, May his favour be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. He is with you. He is with you. In the morning, in the evening, in your coming, and you're going, in your weeping, and your rejoicing, he is for you, he is for you. And Molly is in the depths of grief, but she's saying that so beautifully. And, you know, while they were singing, Ali was up there behind Molly, 
when they were singing He is for you, she was pointing out. And there would have been 350, 400 people there. He is for you. He is for you. He is for you. This is the church. This is the church. They sang, that, that, they sang those songs and, and yet they don't understand why Martin was taken, why, why he would, had to leave them. I, I certainly don't understand. But they have this unwavering faith, trust and knowledge that God reigns. That he is love and he is good. Our lives are not our own. They've been brought with a, a precious, incredible price and the greatest expression of love ever. But there's also the knowing that this life on earth is far from the end. It is only just the beginning. And I know there are some here, maybe many, who have experienced a similar tragedy. Maybe you can't even put into words your loss and pain. When we first met with Ali, after the accident, we couldn't speak. They couldn't speak. We just hugged. There were no words. I'm a little bit emotional here, but to be honest, I'm full of joy. <laughs> um, you know, it may be something altogether different for you. Maybe it's not the loss of a, someone, but maybe it's fear or anxiety or inner turmoil or, you know, an inability to understand, your inability to understand, maybe related to something entirely different. And I want to pray for you. I want, to sh I want us to share this prayer together, together as the body of Christ. And... Um, and be at the same time praying, praying for one another. So, and let, let this be part of our true and pure fellowship this morning. Just bring down all the guards in your heart. Let your heart be, you know, just have that place of purity right now. And I'd like to pray right now in the midst of my message. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are simply the clay. You are the potter. We are the created ones, but you are the divine creator. And most of us know and have experienced life enough to see just how frail and temporary it is. Even things we build around us that we see are beautiful, that you compare to flowers growing in the field, even those things eventually wither and fall from their stems. And I proclaim this morning that while our hearts are open and vulnerable, that you would impart such a purity, such a revelation of of, of um, that, you, you know, that you are the one who has beautiful feet, carrying a precious, precious message that salvation carries with it eternity. And eternity is forever beautiful, pure, and full of peace. Purify our hearts even now, Father. Fill us with light. Fill us with hope. And for those who hold things in their hearts, whether intentionally or unintentionally, that in some way cause a barrier to purity and fellowship with those around them. Father, we ask that you gently and completely bring those things down. Help us to choose life and healing. Help us to allow the purifying presence of the Holy Spirit to do his work deep on the inside. This, this is not just for our sake, but for the sake of those who are still lost and searching. That as we love one another with pure hearts, Others around us will see what it truly means that we are your disciples and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus said just before his death and resurrection in John 18, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate, on behalf of, you know, Jesus' accusers, then asked him the question and said, well, are you, are you king? Are you a king? And Jesus said, you are right. I am a king, and for this cause I was born. When I, when I say that, it just sends shivers down my back. The most powerful kingdom in existence, the kingdom of light, that existed before time began, was confronting the lame, self-righteous and impotent kingdom of the world. It was, though, a battle of cosmic proportions, but the weapons and strategies are very, very different. Part of our expression as people with beautiful feet is that because we have Jesus in us, we also have beautiful feet. And um, part of that expression 
is that we live our lives in a way that proclaims God's kingdom and Christ as the one who reigns. Last year I shared with, um, I had a dream uh, and I shared it with the church in Ballina and a couple of you here might remember and it felt like one of those God dreams that you have. Sometimes you know it's just because you're tired or you've <laughs> eaten too much. Um, but this, you know, I've had a few God dreams in my time. This was a God dream. Um, and I, I was in the same room as Queen Elizabeth. Mm. I don't know, impressive. Um, my dream space hadn't caught up with the fact that there had been a change in the monarchy. Uh, so we're, we're in the castle. And I, I don't mean that, you know, she's, I, I, she didn't come back from the dead or anything. Um, I'm not spe into speaking to the dead. It, it was, if it had been Charles who was alive, it still would have been really illogical. Um, but I simply believe the Queen was symbolic in my dream as the head of a kingdom. And in the dream, she had two people with her. People who I have known, Venice and I have known really well and have been part of our journey in ministry. No one here no one in Seacoast, but they are two of the people Venice and I have ministered to and done life with for a season. People who, that we've really cared about, but they were broken. They were both broken, very broken. And as I always say, we are all broken to some extent because we, all, we live in a broken world and we need the one who heals. And praise God, he is, we are redeemed and we are being sanctified. So the Queen was saying to me, this is uh, what the kingdom of life, or, this is what the kingdom, this is what kingdom life is all about. The love you have shown these two, the time of fellowship uh, that you have given them, the non-judgmental approach to, you know, that you have attempted to take with this couple, uh, this is what it's like living in my kingdom. And of course, the Queen somehow represented God. And straight away I remembered, of course, the, the parable uh, that Jesus told in Matthew 25, Jesus said, when you were hungry, you gave me food. When, you, when I was thirsty, sorry, when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. Sick and you visited me in prison and you came to me. And those listening to Jesus said, well, when did we do any of these things for you? And in Matthew 25, 40, it says, and the king, the king will answer and say to them, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it, to, to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. This again is talking about who we are under the lordship of our king. And I woke up from my dream. So I just say, Lord God, let, let your kingdom come, your kingdom, not mine. Because as much as I, re I recall investing a lot into these two people, there are those that I have also failed. There are opportunities that I have missed. And my heart motivations haven't always been so pure. So Lord, let your kingdom fill me more and more. Let your kingdom be manifest in the church more and more. The kingdom of God can involve cosmic spiritual battles. But on the other side of it, um, the spectrum, it can also be very personal, so intimate, searching the depths of our own heart and life. We have to come back to always, you know, the fact that Jesus said uh, what he said about kingdom living, uh, being kingdom minded. And he gives us many glimpses of that through his own life, how he lived his life. It was sacrificial. It was others centered. It was always with pure motivations. It was always redemptive. He always ministered reconciliation, healing and hope. That's what we should be doing. Jesus always came from a heart of compassion, empowering others to expand God's kingdom further. So my prayer this morning is that we would be empowered. Empowered to love ourselves, to forgive ourselves where we have failed. Empowered to hand over our hurts, our inability to understand everything. And empowered to allow the seed and the gift of purity to fill our hearts and minds. But also empowered to bring light and genuine love and fellowship to others, especially to the household of faith, the word of God says. Finally, receive a fresh revelation to this morning that because our God reigns and the kingdom of God and light resides within us, we, then, we also then have beautiful feet. To carry, but we carry also an authority 
in the spirit that is not only empowering, it is supernatural as well. Matthew 28 says, And Jesus came and spoke to his disciples, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the kingdom of God, we have, we hold that authority. All authority has been given to Jesus, and as his disciples, we carry that same authority. And now this is my really final thing (laughs) to say. I want to share a powerful and personal, very personally special moment that happened last year when we baptised our grandson, James. He was only 12 at the time, but he's now a much more mature and taller 13-year-old. God has given me this... God has given him a revelation of how kingdom life works even at that young age and he began his little speech just before he was baptized about what baptism meant to him and he said this quote these are his words the way I think of baptism is winning a war and saying goodbye to the war field knowing I have won the war field is the enemy and all of my sins When I go under the water, I am going to know that I have won and I am going to become a man of God, knowing the devil is under my feet and I will be forever with God by my side. Isn't that wonderful? Good on you, James. What a great name too, by the way. (laughs) James has won the war by giving himself completely to the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God and of heaven. And I want you to be inspired that God is doing what only he can do. No one else can do that in a young child. Only God can do that. He can only, and only God can do it in us. Our part, even in the midst of, of tragedy and not understanding why some things happen, is to come to him and worship, to declare that he reigns, that he is good, that, we, that he can nurture the seed of purity that he has placed in our hearts and our lives. We can love others with a pure heart. We are empowered to do that. And we would, that we would know what true fellowship is. Not just for our sake, but as a witness to those who are yet to know Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me just pray one more prayer. Father, I pray that this word would wash over us. Our mind, our heart, our soul, our spirit, our innermost being. We are the church. Far from religious. Lord, you are looking for a people who genuinely love one another with pure hearts. And I declare that this is the church. This is who we are. And we Open that gift of life and of light today and receive all that you have for us in Jesus' name. Amen.